TNC Original African Stories Listener discretion is advised as this podcast may contain violence or strong language. Previously on My Name is AZ What was what, this? <laughs> Your salary? 100,000 Naira Aziz Never in my life. Mr. HZ. Shebi, that's your new name now. Nah. Eh? Big boy HZ. We all know that that that, that sports and snobbish daughter of Chief Adeto Kumbo George has cast a spell on you. <sighs> he was right. So is it a yes or a no? What? Did you go to church or not? This is a tough question, seeing as your marrying me is hinged on the answer. Yeah? <laughs> Who is marrying you? <laughs> HZ. Please, I need you to come and get me. Please, please. Jesus. The bag was full of money. AZ, AZ. In that bag, I have 9 million naira. Yes, 9 million. A gift from one of my customers. And that gift, it can be for you and I. Just look me in the eye and give me an answer now. I could barely look away from the road as it felt like I was the one driving. It took mild distractions, well, not so mild distractions, from Cassie to get me to look her way. She moved in closer to me and laid her head on my thighs. She looked up, smiling at me, and I looked down at her with the thought of a new life ahead of us floating in my head. Cassie tried to seize the moment like she always did. She moved up, and closed in to kiss me. As our lips met, I thought to myself, something here isn't right. Everything really. Cassie and I cozy in the backseat of a cab with nine million naira stashed in a bag in the boot of the car. No. I shook my head and woke up from my thoughts. Cassie was standing right next to me, so close I could feel her breathing heavily. I'm sorry, Cassie. I can't. As I said those words, I noticed the shock that took over Cassie. It was almost as if she was absolutely sure I was going to say yes. She didn't say a word in response. She walked back to sit on one of the chairs, almost falling in the process. I stood where I was and waited. For what? I wasn't sure. I really wouldn't have been bothered if she decided not to pay me. Being around her was enough trouble. I really just needed to leave. I took one more look at her, and as I turned to leave, she called out to me. Is it? I turned back, and then she threw about eight bundles of 1,000 naira notes at me. Most bundles didn't make it to me. Cassie just seemed so weak and disappointed. She could barely look at me when she said, That's your money. Please, Please just take it and leave. I looked at the scattered mints on the floor. Mama's image came to my mind, and I instantly picked up the money. Without taking another look at Cassie, I turned around and left. I stashed the money in the pigeonhole of the car. I couldn't help but take another look at Princess's test result. It was just then I noticed the name of the hospital. It was one of the best, if not the best in the country. I knew this because the doctors at Mama's clinic had recommended it as a possible location for Mama's surgery. It made sense for someone like Princess to only use that kind of hospital. I replaced the results, locked the pigeonhole, and got on my way. It was still only about 2 a.m. I figured I could make it back to school by 3 and see if I could get some reading done before morning. I went through Agigi, and as I approached the Keja, I saw a police checkpoint ahead. There was a car ahead of me. They didn't stop it. Good. I was glad they weren't stopping all cars. As I got closer, I noticed one of the policemen waving me down. Oh no, maybe I should just give them what they want before they ask, I thought to myself. I got to the checkpoints, cleared to the side, and parked. Officer, where do I know? Yes, yes, yes. Where are you coming from at this time? Officer, I just go drop my sister for a house. I see make a quick run, go back, go school. Sister, at this time? I try to laugh and make a joke out of it. And now on small emergency day like that, the policeman looked away and spoke to the one on the other side. I knew he was calling him to come over. Two to one, I was outnumbered. I had to give up something. I immediately took out my key and dropped it at the side of my seat. 
and then got out some money from my pocket. When the other officer turned to look at me, he asked me to come out of the car. Officer, I beg oh, all this one no necessary now. See, just take this one. Just use and manage this night. I held out the money I had taken out to him. It was a 500 naira note. The police officer looked at me and I felt as his countenance changed. Ah, 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 ah. What is this? Are you, are you trying to bribe a police officer of the Federal Republic of Nigeria? Uh, 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 officer. Will you get out of that car, you bloody thief? He said, yelling, even as he reached for the handle of my door. By then, the other officer had gotten there. They were both armed. And I couldn't risk putting back the key in the ignition and driving off. I opened my door. And the moment I got out, the second officer dragged me aside while the first officer began to search the car frantically. He looked everywhere, almost as if he was looking for something in particular. He then tried to open the pigeonhole, and he noticed it was locked. Where is the key? He shouted. I, I, I don't have the key. It's with my madame. I felt a heavy slap on my face from the second police officer. <laughs> I said, where is the key to that place? Eh? This time, he barked louder. Despite the fact that he stood inches away from me, bathing me in saliva. It was then I perceived the heavy smell of alcohol in his breath. Fear took hold of me instantly. I had heard several stories of how people got shot and killed by drunk policemen. And now I was standing face to face with two of them. What was I going to do? Tell them where the key was and risk losing my mom's money as well as getting killed? Or stick to my decision? Growing up, I had my stubborn moments, but largely, I was never one of those ridiculously stubborn children who always frustrated their parents. In fact, Mama often said I needed to be manlier about setting things. Was this one of those things? The odds certainly didn't favor me, but for some reason I still can't explain, I decided to stick with my initial position. Oh God, oh God, I, I, don't, I don't know where the key is. Now my mother and the keep up. I felt the cold rush of water dripping on my face. Ah! 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 <coughs> it hurt. Everything, everywhere was hurting. I tried hard to open my eyes, and I could only manage to open one. My vision was blurry but I could make out two towering figures standing on either side of me. Just then, I felt the cold, harsh pain of my bare back on the concrete. I tried to move again, but I couldn't. The cold water poured down on my face again. I heard laughter in the background, even as my vision finally stabilized. I looked up to see two men standing beside me, one on each side. The one on my left side was remarkably dark. It was about five feet six and really, really dark. His brown teeth glaring down at me from his grin were the brightest things on him. And he was stark naked. His member standing erect pointed at the man on the right side, who was almost a complete opposite of the first man. Tall, light-skinned, also not fully closed. He had on a pair of trousers made out of guinea material. The waist rope was long and untied, dangling just above me. I noticed a sachet of pure water in the hands of the taller man. He squeezed the water sachet again, more ice-cold water on my face. I still couldn't open my right eye. I tried to get up and this time, I was able to turn my body sideways excruciating spasms of pain ran through me as I tried to turn. I'm all get to. I'm just set. I said we just did the things here while y'all go follow us and new year. God, just bring this fresh fish come like this. Minutes later, I felt his hand pulling me up. It was then I looked down and realized I was only wearing my boxers. I couldn't make out where I was but it was poorly lit and hollow with a strong stench of old urine. With my single eye, I looked at the walls and saw several inscriptions. Ajala was here, O seven. Fashola, O Botinubu. To God be that glory. There was one section that had so many writings, it almost looked like a mural. The thoughts began to come back. 
The policeman. The checkpoint. The car. My money. My right eye popped open and it was then I saw the metal bars. We were in what looked like the courtyard of a cell. A cell? There were doors all around that led to this open space. Two gossers ran across the yard, stinking seriously. I turned my attention back to the hands that were moving me. They belonged to the tall light man. The other man lingered behind, still beaming heavily. I was in so much pain, I just couldn't move anymore. And even my Samaritan noticed and proceeded to heave me onto his shoulder. As he walked towards one of the seemingly dark rooms, I heard a voice call out, Sherry! Sherry! Matthew! Ah! Claude now! Claude! Sherry was the guy carrying me. His voice was a huge contrast to his figure. If anything at all, he sounded like a mouse and looked like an elephant. Somewhere in my thoughts, I managed a laugh. Matthew! You know what? You make you know they shook your mouth for our business, so... The shorter man said, his voice sounded like that of a veteran Agbero. I heard locks being opened, and as Siri dropped me, I realized Matthew was a police officer, the police officer, and he had come into the courtyard with two other officers. Hey, boys, am I Binijari? Elate, Law, Ogalin King Biwa. Amidst shouts and murmurs of displeasure, why were they so unhappy? The other two policemen dragged me out of the courtyard with Matthew trailing behind. We moved into an office area. It was also poorly lit. The walls looked like they had been painted by the inmates. Green, glossy paint over unevenly plastered walls. On the walls were portraits of the president, state governor, and current IG of police. I didn't recognize his voice immediately, but it didn't take long for me to. Standing by the counter was Senior. He was having a word with one of the other police officers who looked well-dressed in the blue and black ceremonial uniform. They shook hands and then Matthew dropped some clothes in front of me. They were mine. I felt some strength return to me out of nowhere. Maybe it was the thought of almost being free. I managed to wear my clothes with some help from Matthew and a few minutes later, I, Senior and Matthew were in a car with another policeman. It was bright outside. I checked Senior's watch and I noticed it was almost 1pm. I had been knocked out and in this mess for almost 9 hours. I thought to myself, wow. The policeman drove us to the checkpoint I was stopped at earlier. I and Senior got out and then they drove off. Where is the key? I hopped to the car. My left leg was almost dead. Opened the door and stretched my hand to the side of the driver's seat. I felt the key almost immediately, pulled it out and Senior took it. Go and sit. I went round to the passenger side in front and got into the car. Without a word, Senior started the engine and began to drive. I wanted to ask where we were heading, how he knew where I was, and all the other questions that filled my head. But I was too weak to talk. My eyes fluttered and then shut again. I woke up the sounds of my name. Aziz. Aziz. It was Senior. How did he know my name? My real name? How? I was drowsy. I looked around and noticed we were in front of my hostel. How did he... I couldn't think. I'll drop the car off at Princess's house. You can get the key from the hell. I got out of the car and Senior zoomed off. I dragged myself into my room and all I wanted to do was get rid of the raging pain rampaging through my body. I finally got into my room and as I shut the door, I caught a reflection of my face in the mirror behind it. Jesus. There was a huge black patch on the right side of my face. That explained the pain. I took off my clothes then and looked around my body for other cuts or bruises. No visible marks, but I still felt the pain. I needed rest. I scurried through my locker, looking for a painkiller. I looked at my watch and noticed it read the day as Tuesday instead of Monday. Was I hallucinating? I needed sleep. I found some Panadol extra got pure water, took it, and somehow found my way to the bed. I woke up the next morning to the pain and grumbling from my stomach. Hunger. I managed to get out of bed. The pain had subsided in some parts of my body, and I could open both my eyes, even though it still hurt a lot. I had barely began wondering where to start my hunt for food when I saw a nylon bag 
right beside my bed. It was from an eatery. I opened it and found a pack of food, fruits, a phone, and some drugs. The same part of me would have freaked out and fainted, but I was too hungry to think sane. I assumed Senior had come back to drop it, and so I began eating the food. I finished it all in a matter of minutes and proceeded to take the drugs in the bag. <sighs> I knew I had to get out of my room and move around if I wanted to heal quickly enough. I managed to fetch a bucket of water. The hostel was almost completely empty. It was a few days to Christmas. Everyone had left the school, except some serious ethicals, and myself, of course. I brought my bucket of water to the room and heated it with Dari's boiling ring, went and took my bath. I returned to the room feeling much better. I tried to move around, and though I felt pain, I was able to. I got dressed then, and it wasn't until I wore my clothes that I thought about the phone. I picked it up and realized my old SIM card was placed in it. I had all my numbers stored in it, and even a couple of messages from Fadike. She was just checking up on me as usual and wondering what I had been up to, except reading. If only she knew. I had a missed call from Ongomufu, and that was it. I had too many questions on my mind, but even thinking hurt at that point. I thought about Uncle Mufu and how I had promised to spend time with him and his family during this break. I decided to go there. Uncle Mufu's house wasn't far. He lived in Abulioja, even though he had several other houses in highbrow areas of Lagos. I walked out of my room after checking to make sure I had a decent enough light to cover the ring around my eye. I got out of school, bought shades for my eyes before stopping the bike. I got to Uncle Mufu's house in minutes. I met him outside, getting ready to leave. Uncle, a carousel. Ah, Aziz. Ibuloma ten so phone and sino. What they call, call, call. Eh? Emma Binusa, mo lazident yeni. Hmm. Accident, Abi. Hmm. I took off my shades and showed him my eye. He moved closer, tilted my face with his hand, and gave me a look that said, "Accident indeed." And then he said, "Beleo, sha marora." Eshe sa. Oya o, wale si numoto. I was surprised. He asked no further questions and acted as if he was expecting me. I had no choice. I got into the passenger side in front. I thought about offering to drive, but I knew I was not exactly in the right condition. That aside, Uncle Mufu hardly allowed any other person drive him. I hope we weren't going far because I didn't even know what to say to my uncle. Luckily, the journey was short. We drove into Luth a few minutes after, and I imagined he was stopping by to visit a friend. Uncle Mufu said little. He just asked about school, and that was it. We went into the hospital, and after talking to a few people, he came back to get me from where I sat. A nurse walked ahead of us, and we followed. I wondered what we had come to do, or who we had come to see, and my mind was still wondering when the nurse opened the door to one of the admission rooms, and there she was, Mommy. I exclaimed. I looked at Uncle Mufu, and then the nurse, and then back to Mama. I, I, is she okay? What is she doing here? How, how did she get here? Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, easy, easy. Don't wake her. Uh -uh. Don't worry, don't worry. Everything is well. Yabo is better treated here. I, I could know you need her close, so I moved her here. I couldn't explain how happy I was. I was ecstatic. This was indeed a Christmas miracle. I held on to Uncle Mufu's hands and thanked him profusely. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, <laughs> no need to thank me. My worry. He said as he held my shoulder. Aziz, you know you're like a son to me. I just want you to be happy all the time. I didn't know what to say or how to respond to him. I looked at Mama and then out of nowhere, a smile appeared on her face. <laughs> 